We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Nils Johnson, uh, founder of Beautylish, an active angel investor in the e-commerce space, has been an angel investor in Airtime, Warby Parker, and Wantful. Nils, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me. So yeah. recently, uh, I think it was last week, Britney Spears showed up at Beautylish. Uh, that's got to be the first question I ask. What's going on there? Yeah, so we were fortunate. Brittany paid us a visit and um, came up with some of her management team to spend some time. She's basically conquered like things in fashion and fragrance, and I think she was just really interested in beauty, and that's something that she's been thinking about. Right, and I mean, but she's been active, right? And there's there's kind of a history of totally. um, Hollywood celebrities interacting with Silicon Valley companies. How did this happen, and how does it tie in with what Beautylish is doing? Yes, yeah, so her team has been very active in social media, and many people don't realize she's one of the biggest on Google+, Plus. she's huge on Facebook, she's huge on Twitter, and so her management team, Larry, Adam, and Robin have done just a really great job of having her out there and involved, and I think now they've just been looking at like things that Brittany is personally passionate about, and beauty happens to be one of those spaces, so that's how we kind of got put together. And so what does Beautylish do at its core that drew someone like her into, into your company? Yeah, so Beautylish is a community site based on product reviews, makeup tutorials, forums, and people sharing photos of inspiring looks. And basically our idea originated with, you know, looking at the women's space in general. Most people in the Valley, as you know, just tend to ignore it as it's guys and they're not really relating uh, firsthand to, you know, opportunities in the market. And what we'd seen in beauty was, you know, we didn't see anything that we thought was really like a market leader, most importantly. And when we examine and, and kind of step back and thinking like, how do women purchase beauty products? There was three steps of discovering a product, researching it and transacting. And so we wanted to create a site that would really focus on the first two, which is essentially the top of the funnel and we felt was really difficult around the discovery and research of beauty products. And so tell us just a little bit more about the company. How long ago was it started? Who did you start it with? And sort of where are you today? Yep, so I have two co-founders. Uh, both are engineers. One was previously run, uh, VP of engineering with Hot or Not, uh, and another one of our co-founders was an engineer at YouTube. And so we had launched the site in about 18 months ago in October uh, 2010. And basically, again, the idea was like just building a really passionate community of sharing looks and tutorials. And then we have an editorial component of the site as well, which is something that will share new product information uh, or you know just work with brands on. Uh, educating and whatnot. And so it sounds like you're trying to build an entirely new brand that's online only, right? That's and so correct. How has that, you know, have you found that to be a challenge or are people hungry for it? No, totally. I mean, our initial idea actually came from seeing what was going on with YouTube and so many of the makeup tutorials becoming really popular on the platform. And so we recognize like young girls, this is actually a shift of behavior of how people are learning about beauty products and online, particularly through the use of video, has been the best way to share product information. And so, you know, taking kind of that cue was originally where we had, had the idea to get started. I see. And so steps for the future or, or into 2012, like what are your, your goals for, for Beautylish? Yeah, so we're really just trying to focus on how do we build the best tools to empower the community and how do we continue to raise the bar and inspire them, um, giving them new outlets to create. So. Um, again, it's just really focusing on things that the community is asking us for and, and making it, better tools. For and them. it's completely fo focused around beauty products. That's correct. I see. Now, if we step back a little bit and talk about, you're, you're a very active angel investor and been quite well known. I mean, you're not on Twitter, but everyone who knows e-commerce knows who you are, and you've probably seen a lot of those deals come through. And you know, Warby Parker, Everlane, Wantful. What are the trends that you're seeing in the e-commerce space? I mean, clearly companies like Fab and other companies are building entirely online brands and just you know ripping through revenue uh, at an amazing rate. What are you seeing right on the ground? So one of the things I'm really excited about in commerce space and have been fortunate to invest in some companies like Warby and Wantful that you mentioned, uh, yeah. another company called Everlane, is basically brands that are focusing either on creating a vertically integrated business, which is everything from making the product to delivering that and cutting out the middlemen. So they're able to offer you know, better value to the consumers. And there's essentially an opportunity because cost of customer acquisition has become so low due to social media. So rather than, rather than aggregating or collecting inventory or excess inventory from another supplier, these companies are actually going in and creating the glasses, creating the, um, the fashion accessories that are gonna be sold directly to the consumer. Exactly. And, and it's tied back into the brand. Correct. And I mean, really, that's where they have the opportunity to scale. 
So Warby Parker doesn't have a problem of supply running out necessarily because they are the producer, they source the goods, you know, they produce the glasses. Everlane is doing the same thing uh, in the market that they're focused on. And so I know you're very active with your companies. I know when Everlane started, it was more about aggregating, right? Or sort of curating That's correct. Uh, other people. So what were the lessons there? And it seems like almost Warby learned from that yep. uh, lesson going forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think when, when Everlane originally started, they were focused on the idea of curators and figuring out like an aesthetic and a taste level and a direction. Yeah. And really the idea was a little bit like what Zara had hit on in retail, which was, you know, look to people who have a good taste level and see what direction that leads you in from merchandising point of view. And, you know, as they had kind of started with that seed, they had some great ideas of where to get started. And now they've successfully launched probably over six collections of merchandise. This is on Everlane. Growing very quickly. That's correct, right. on Everlane. And so then when Warby Parker started after that, they had that learning, right? Instead of, instead of farming out the process for yep. you know, building, building eyeglasses, right? You're just doing it all in-house. Correct. So Warby Parker was a little different situation, which okay. was uh, the founding team had seen like, you know, wire glasses, $400 a pair when the cost of that is just a fraction. And so they investigated the entire supply chain. Um, and actually they had started um, before Everlane and, and started working on this idea. Um, but it was really like, hey, if we cut out the middlemen, which is controlled by these large conglomerates, we can deliver high quality, fashionable pair of glasses for less money. And so again, it's like they're manufacturing the product and they're also acquiring the customers. So they're extracting efficiencies out of not only the manufacturing process, but also the scale of the internet. Correct, and, and, so, and really the customer acquisition side. I see, and so what areas do you, are you waiting for some entrepreneur to knock on your door, or send you an email, you know, in, in the same way that Warby and Everlane got to you, what areas do you think, you know, aside from beauty, um, that are just ripe for this kind of business? I mean, I think essentially if you walk through a mall and you look at a lot of the businesses that are large tenants in the mall today, I mean, there's a growing theme of um, kind of the death of retail, if you will. And a number of these categories are still wide open. And knowing that the internet is typically a winner-take-all business and very efficient at cutting out middlemen, I think more of these integrated models, like an Everlane, like a Warby, um, will be very successful. So that might be, you know, in the lingerie space, for example, it could be somebody doing a business like Ikea more efficiently using the web. And those are opportunities that I'm excited about and just always, you know, poking around and looking for something. And so. So just talking about the mall, because this is something I'm, I'm fascinated in. I mean, I yep. went to a mall where my folks live a couple months ago over the holidays, and I was just shocked to see the degradation and quality of stores in the mall, one, totally. and the amount of empty spaces. Yep. And it just seemed really depressing to go in there. Totally. And I just talked to other people who went home over the holidays and across the country and felt the same thing. Totally. Clearly, there are a lot of macro things going on, but do you feel like the days in the mall are over? I think what's and the malls are moving online, sorry. Totally. I mean, basically what's happened is, you know, there's a reverse network effect happening, which is when one anchor tenant closes, it actually has impact on all the other tenants that are in, in that mall. And online today through, you know, social media in particular, you're able to deliver compelling brand stories and start these like online first brands um, that I think younger people connect with. I mean, Facebook is the new mall essentially, so kids aren't hanging out you know, at, Hills, at Hillsdale Mall, they're hanging out, you know, on Facebook, online, um, and that's where they're discovering the new brands as well. So maybe a bit of advice for people who are out there who are thinking about this. I mean, there's clearly a lot of activity in the space. How, what are some of the best learnings you've, you've seen either through, through Beautylish or through your angel investments about building a brand online, right? This is where Everlane and Warby Parker yep. are coming on. They don't have physical stores, right? But they've kind of created this brand already. Like, how do yep. you do that? Yeah, I think it's something that's a little bit undervalued in the Valley because most success here has not been built through building brands, starting off with an initial brand, but brands have been a result of becoming like dominant platforms or, you know, as a business has spread globally. Uh, and that's something that guys like Warby, for example, they started in New York. New York is a more brand centric um, community, ad centric community. And really taking the time and thinking about like clear messaging, quality product, what is that consumer experience going to be? And that's something that I would say is probably the most important rather than simply, um, you know, how do we scale quickly to get a bunch of traffic, um, but not having a clear brand message. And Wantful is a great example. You know, it's a great gifting service. People love it so much when they receive a Wantful gift in the mail um, that they go on and they tell other friends. And right. that becomes really compelling again because it's low cost uh, customer acquisition. Okay. And let's talk bro broadly about sort of e-commerce opportunities at the seed level. You're obviously seeing a lot of things. Are yeah. you, you know, I hear people chattering that there's too many companies that are trying to put stuff in a box in the subscription model, right? It, are there, 
continuous opportunities for that, or at some point, you know, are those going to also knock it off the ground? In, in subscription models? Yeah. I think the subscription model is basically, you know, there, there's a few varieties of that model. There's some which are vertically integrated companies like Shoe Dazzle uh, or The Honest Company or Beachman that I think are in a little different position because they control, again, the supply of their business. Um, Overall, I think one of the challenges with subscription is over time, I believe it looks a little more like an ad arbitrage business. Um, and you know, the utmost important thing is to be providing tremendous value to your subscribers. So if you're able to provide value, right. um, you will see some large and, companies. And so this is the effect of Netflix being so, That's right. so dominantly successful. What, what are some new pricing models that entrepreneurs out there can experiment with that you've seen coming up that you know, are warrant attention? So I think with regards to pricing, I mean, you know, there's two schools of thought. One is subscription and calculating a lifetime value based off of that monthly subscription times, um, you know, how long they'll stay on. And the other is just how much share can you get of someone spending in a category, um, which I think keeps you a little more honest potentially to a customer over time, just as you're trying to go for continually greater spend. Um, and the opportunity is there because you're not locked in on one fixed monthly cost. I see. And so final question for entrepreneurs out there who are currently you know, cutting their teeth at the seed level with an e-commerce company or have an idea and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to you know, kind of grab your attention and also hook you into an idea? You've seen so many deals. You know, can you share a little bit about you know, what separates the winners from, from the rest of the pack? I mean, for me in e-commerce right now, one of the most important things is just great branding and great consumer experience. And so in the case of Warby Parker, in the case of Everlane, in the case of Wantful, all three of those companies I actually reached out to because I thought they were doing an amazing job. And you know, fortunately, I was able to, you know, the entrepreneur allowed me to get involved with the company. So I would say if you're doing something really great, you know, that's the most important thing and you'll attract people that are interested. Great. Well, congrats to you and good great. luck this year to Beautylish. Thanks for coming Thanks. in.